Number 10, Psalms, First Quarter, 2024, Daniel Duda. Before we begin Lesson 10, Lessons of the Past, from the Book of Psalms, Rita is going to offer a prayer for us. Almighty God, we thank you that you are our understanding and loving Father and most trusted friend. Your greatest desire is that we learn who you really are and want to be like you and can become like you, that you may recreate the image of yourself in us. We thank you, Lord, for this group, this Pinal group, and for the leading of Daniel and John in helping us to get to know you better, that we may be able to go into the world and into our families and into ourselves and learn more of you and show the world more of you. And we long for the day when we can all meet again, which may not be now on this earth, but we know that we can meet with you when you come again and eventually in the earth made new, which we look forward to and hope that you can see that day coming very soon. May we all be ready for that, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen, and thank you, Rita, and welcome, everybody. Good to have you for lesson number 10. And it's going to look at the historical aspects, how the psalmists look at the past. And in lesson number eight, when we discussed the psalms there, we said that we'll come back to the importance of remember in the biblical thinking and worship theology. All right, so our memory text is from Psalm 78, verse 3 and 4, which we have heard and known. Our fathers have told us we will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. So notice that Psalm 78 is a psalm of Asaph. So once again, don't attribute it to David. As David said, and it's actually a psalm of Asaph, it's a long psalm, it's 72 verses, so we are not going to read it all, but the question is, if you look at it, look in your Bible or in your digital version, what are the three historical events or epochs that are highlighted in this psalm? Why is it that he starts with saying, give ear, my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. A classical parallelism, poetic parallelism. I will open my mouth in a parable. will utter dark sayings from an old. Things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. Why part of worship experience is this constant repetition what happened? What role does Zakar? remember, Hebrew word for remember, play in Old Testament worship. How did the Old Testament people remember God? Perry? Wasn't it by reviewing their past history with him and even specific occurrences? That made them part of that history. And doesn't it also help to cement into our memory and our confidence that when things were bad before and God acted, based on the history of how God acted before, we can have trust that that's how he'll act again in the future. And that somehow he will act in our lives. We might not see it today. It might be different than we expect it, but somehow he will act and we are going to watch out for those events and ways of acting in our lives. Tim? They didn't have Bibles to read, and most of them, I'm sure, couldn't read anyway. So they did a lot of memorizing, and they got together frequently, at least three or four times a year as a group, to remember and recount what God had done. Yes, although in Israel, there was a strong emphasis on reading as well. So in most other nations, even medieval Europe, most people were illiterate. But in Israel, they put emphasis on reading. So they had these schools where the children were sent and they taught them how to read. It was a very important part of national identity. But yes, 
it's a oral culture so you repeat these stories and part of the worship life is that they meet together for these festivals three times per year and they repeat the history neil neil leminski doesn't part of this come down to the old expression that repetition is the mother of memory of learning yeah and it wasn't part of the bar mitzvah when jesus went to the temple becoming a son of the law they had to be able to read and they had to know the pentateuch yes so this was enforced upon their memory and every one of them could repeat it yes and if you practice it your memory is very elastic and learns to remember the large segments of material so if you are married, you know what I am talking about. You understand it. The best way to kick spark into your relationship is to start remembering how it all started. So when they say, when we went out of Egypt, it seemed to us like a dream. Waters on the right, waters on the left. And we went through on a dry land. They didn't go out of Egypt. But by repeating that story, my story now becomes part of that history. Remember in 19th century America, when the slaves are singing, I've got shoes, you've got shoes. Why would the slave owner get so upset that they are singing, I've got shoes? Why would you beat them? No, you have no shoes, you are barefooted. Don't you care? As long as the job is done, let them sing whatever they want to sing. No, they know very well. If you've got shoes on your mind, it's only a question of time that you will have shoes on your feet. Because what you sing, what you think about, what you repeat, that becomes part of your story. And so that what happened then and there becomes part of here and now. And by the way, that's what good preaching does. A good preaching clicks the Bible story with your personal story. That you see what you are going through now in your life as an extension and part of that story of the Bible. If I ask you which are the sermons that you remember from the past, you know, and there are sermons that I remember 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it's always that common denominator that somehow you feel how it clicks, that that story becomes part of your story. And that's why this is so important that they remind themselves and their children, this is our story. This is who we are. Because the mighty acts of God become part of who they are. Our story today is an extension and continuation of that old story. Okay, Michael? Well, some of this bound up with this belief, with the accurate belief, that they were the chosen people of God as such very special people to God. And therefore, sure, they... although it takes some exegesis, what does it mean that? When God says in Exodus 19, and if you do this now, after I have taken you out of Egypt, you will be my exquisite property. You will be my special people. What does it mean that they are chosen people? Now, very quickly, they turn it into exclusivistic club. But when you read Genesis 12, the call of Abraham, being chosen means to be the source of blessing for others, to be an instrument of blessing others. So it's not a position of privilege, it's a position of service. But pretty quickly degraded to that. Oh, it's... yes. And that's why by the time of Jesus, the question is not whether others will be saved. The question is, who among us is going to be saved? There's no question about the Gentiles. They are out. And so they have this us versus them mentality that God tries to counteract. So. Let's read 78, verse 1 and 4. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. And verse 4. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. And let's read 8 to 11. And that they should not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimites armed with the bow turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. 
They forgot what he had done and the miracles that he had shown them. And verse 17, 18. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. And 21, therefore, the result was. When the Lord heard, he was full of rage. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger mounted against Israel. And 22. Because they had no faith in God and did not trust his saving power. So can you see how it shows God's choosing Abraham? And also it shows the human rebellion. So the constant humiliating failure of Israel is not the cause for God to abandon the project of rescuing the world. Yes, they are chosen people. They are instrument of blessing. And so it celebrates God's choice of Abraham. On the other hand, it does not hide from the fact that they have their share of failure. Let's read Psalm 106, verse 6 and 7. 105 also covers the choice of Abraham, his family, and deliverance from slavery in Egypt, very positive. And next Psalm 106 immediately goes to tell the dark side of the same story. So 106 verses 6 and 7. Both we and our ancestors have sinned. We have committed iniquity, have done wickedly. Our ancestors, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wonderful works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled against the Most High at the Red Sea. Verse 13 and 14. But they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. And 19 and on. They made a calf at Horeb and worshipped a cast image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Okay. So can you see how they can celebrate God's action? And they can also see the dark side of the same story. Now, when was the last time in the context of worship that you heard? Yes, there have been 250,000 people, American Christians, waiting for the soon coming of Jesus. But after they went through the great disappointment, only 300 said, there was something positive about that experience. Let's explore that. Let's learn the lesson. Let's see what was good about that. But then when God revealed some truth to us, when in their humble search, they discovered some answers and the things that have been neglected for centuries, we became legalists as dry as the hills of Gilboa on which there is no rain or mildew. And we became legalists. Par excellence. Have you heard? A Psalm 106 in the context of Advent movement and recounting how important was Minneapolis because the whole movement shifted in the wrong direction. Have you heard anything about the fundamentalist crisis in 1920s? How we became fundamentalists, believing that Bible somehow is verbally inspired and the prophet was verbally inspired and we should take it verbally and literally? Do you think the worship service would be changed if we as Christians could recite that after the movement that Jesus created, we split it into Eastern and Western Christianity, and then it split further into Protestantism, and then it split into 1,000 Protestant sects and denominations? What do you think that re reciting things like that would do to your worship experience? Can you see how, on one hand, they can praise God's unstoppable faithfulness? as the title for Sunday's lesson says, and yet they are honest enough and to say, yeah, let's read verse 34. They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and learned to do as they did. And up to 39. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. 
They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they became unclean by their acts and prostituted themselves in their doings. So what do you think? What are we supposed to learn from these historic psalms? What's the lesson for us? Are these prayers inspired? They are, yeah, they are part of the canon. Are they important for our spirituality, for our life of faith in 21st century where you and I live? Yes, Terry? Well, it certainly seems to highlight the ease with which they got caught up with those who were around them. All right. So they are not chosen, obviously, because they are better, because they fall into these patterns of behavior that betray God and are influenced by those around them easily. So that's a very important part. Michael Bell? It's easy to look back on this and say, well, that was them. This would never happen to us. But we are at risk of that very same thing. And I think if we're not careful, we can just fall back and doing the same kinds of things. I hearken back to Thomas Jefferson, who said that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Well, the price of Christianity is also eternal vigilance. We yes. better pay attention to what, as we would say, what the rules are and try to adhere to them. Because if we don't, we're going to fall into great despair and anguish. For those who don't know the history, repeat the mistakes of history. And that's why historical psalms are that important. So there are three eras, the historical epochs that they concentrate on, and it's the Exodus. How much did they contribute to Exodus? Nothing. God comes and rescues them. Pure grace. The settlement of Canaan. So after 40 years of disobedience and unfaithfulness in the desert, God brings them in. And it's not because the giants disappeared, the walled cities disappeared, or that because they are better than the previous generation. And then, of course, the time of David and the kingdom. Notice they say, we want the king so that we are like all other nations around us. And God says, this is not a good idea. That's not the best way to model how to be the blessing to everybody else. Yet God is going to go with it and take it. And the idea of a suffering servant is going to be the model how God is going to redeem the whole world. So as the Portuguese saying proverb goes, God can write straight even on crooked lines. He can take even these crooked customs like kingdom, monarchy, and make it a revelation of who God is and what he wants to achieve. And so if you look under number two, the human rebellion did not cause God to abandon the creation project. Constant and humiliating failure of Israel did not cause God to abandon the project of rescuing the world. Shall we continue? The failure of the early Christian church did not cause God to abandon. The failure of medieval church did not cause God to abandon the project. The failures of Adventism did not cause God to abandon the project of rescuing the world. Your and my personal deficiencies and shortcomings and failures. Oh, sorry. No, in Pine Knoll, everything is perfect and wonderful, isn't it? Can we learn something from these prayers? So let's go to Karen, Rodney. Yes, as I was hearing them, reading them again, it just reminded me how patient God is with his children. The fact that it, <laughs> they keep messing up and he just keeps loving them. And I think that gives us all hope. So I like that. And that's what good parenting looks like. So God is a model parent that shows us that he loves us unconditionally, even when we mess up. And he wants us to pass it on to our children and the people in our sphere of influence. Rodney, greetings all the way to Ayas and Philippines. Thank you. It's good to be back again. Yes, just yesterday, we were having a devotion about Manasseh, King Manasseh, and it is known to be one of the king that has brought Israel so low, the Bible says, lower than the pagans. And at the very depth of his rulership and leadership, he was taken captive and he repented. 
And I was just amazed how God was very patient with him. And it teaches us to really be patient with people. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Jennifer. When you were talking earlier about when's the last time we heard sermons about failures and that sort of thing, it made me start thinking so much of the time we aren't real with what is going on in the world and our own lives, et cetera. We just put on this facade of, oh, everything's fine. And we don't really tell people what's going on. And But it's real. And I think unless we're real, God can't help us with our problems. And besides the fact that most people, when they look on that, are thinking, oh, what's going on here? I know that these people have problems, but they don't even talk about them or discuss them. and. So it just seems like it's a facade, and I think God wants us to be real, like David was in the Psalms, about how he felt and the troubles he was having, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, and so the Psalms are very helpful. They help us to see the positive things that God has done in history. So they can be very straightforward and direct and celebrate the story of Exodus and insist that God is completely different from the idols of the nations, but they can be very clear about the failures of Israel. And it's not their goodness, but it's only the grace and faithfulness, unchanging faithfulness of God, that they are still where they are. Lou? I think the danger for us today is we are Laodicea. And I think to me that implies that we are sleepwalking. We're not tuned in. We're not connected. We're going through the rituals and through the mechanisms and the things that we think we don't do anything really bad and we don't do anything really, really good. We just kind of occupy till Jesus comes. And that's so far from what God wants us to be. And the children of Israel, they did that. They sleepwalked in the desert, complained and everything else. God doesn't give up. Thank God for that. He doesn't give up on us, but he wants us to wake up. He wants us to really, really, like she was saying a minute ago, to get real, to take off the facades and just going and doing the same thing over and over, but to get very, very real and awake and alive with today with him in my life, in my heart, the Holy Spirit, for me, I think that's what God wants, needs from me, so he can fill my heart, that I'm totally open with him, and I connect my heart to his heart, and the Holy Spirit can flow in and work through and wake us up. I don't want to be a sleepwalking zombie. I want to be a very wide awake, alert, alive child of God that his love can just shine through me and be a blessing to others. Sure. And the letters to seven churches show that God can work with everyone. So he works with Smyrna, he works with Laodicea. Of course, it takes some explanation what it means that we are Laodicea. Let me assure you the churches in Ukraine are definitely not sleeping. They are in the war situation and still meeting and trying to be a beacon of hope to people around them. So, yeah. But once again, it shows that God can work with any of the seven churches and he's in the midst of all of them. Sherry. I think that being very real, both with ourselves and with others, sometimes requires a lot of trust and a lot of courage. And I think knowing what God is really like is something that gives us that courage and that trust. So I think it's really important to keep our eyes on the character of God and what he's really like and how trustworthy he really is and recounting some of the evidence of that in our own lives as well as the lives of others and the lives of history. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Let's go to Psalm 105. And again, it's 45 verses, so let's start just reading the first few. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. 
Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. And let's go to verse 9. The covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. And verse 12. When they were few in number of little account and strangers in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. Yes, and then he speaks about the famine. And verse 17, he sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who has been sold a slave. And he made him the Lord of the Pharaoh's house, verse 21. Verse 23, then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob lives as an alien in the land of Ham. And verse 26, then he sent his servant Moses and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed signs among them, turned waters into blood, verse 29. And the frogs, verse 30. And then 37, he brought Israel out with silver and gold. There was no one among their tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, verse 38, because, verse 42, he remembered his holy promise and Abraham, his servant. Verse 41, he opened the rock, the water gushed out and flowed through the desert like a river. And so he brought his people out with joy, with singing. He gave them the lands of the nations. They took possession of the wealth of other people. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then comes Psalm 106, the next one that we already read, verse 6 and 7. After this positive, exuberant celebration of the divine call to Israel and providential protection that preserved the nation despite everything bad, comes Psalm 106 and the dark side of the same story. We have sinned, we have committed iniquity. We forgot you, we didn't do it, and we already read that one. So, if you look at number three, why is it significant that this rescue mission that God did not abandon because of the sins of Israel, David, Christianity, was to be undertaken by people who were themselves in sore need of the same rescue? What are we supposed to learn from these Psalms? When things are going well, it's easy to pray like the Pharisee in Luke 18, Lord, you must be so happy I am your child. All these things are happening because of what I do. And when things are going bad and not the way you expect, it's easy to get depressed and say, you know how many times I have heard as a pastor a member saying to me, I know why this is happening to me. When I was 16, when I was 18, I did this foolish thing and now God is punishing me. And you feel, really? Is this your model? How you operate? That God was waiting for 30 years and now he has found a chance to hit you. You wouldn't do it to your dog or a cat. Why do you think that God would do this to a human being? So why are these prayers important? And Jennifer? Well, the lesson for us is that God can rescue us too. We're exactly the same. It doesn't do any good to pretend. And people looking on will say, well, these people are having these problems and God is rescuing them. So it, that option is available for me as well. We're all in this same world of sin together. It doesn't do any good to pretend. <laughs> Thank you. Tim? I'm responding to your question in the notes, number three. Why is it significant that the rescue mission was to be undertaken by a people who were themselves in need of the very same rescue? That gives us the chance to tell our story and become part of the larger story and to just remember what God has done for people in the past and to remember what he's doing for us at the same time. And that we participate in that story and it's not about us. It's not about our greatness. It's not the reward for our faithfulness, but it's in spite of our failures and what we do that God is using us. Thank you. Michael? It's easy to fall into that trap of 
I'm having this particular problem or problems as the case may be because of something I did 20, 30, 50 years ago, whatever. And Jesus dispelled that idea, the man born blind. And his disciples ask him, who sinned? Did he sin or did his parents sin? And he makes clear, this has nothing to do with sin. It's just the circumstances of his life. He was born blind. And I had an older sister who lost a child at age six months. And it was just a tragic event now. And she anguished about that pretty much the rest of her life. And why was this happening? Why is she being punished? What did she do? What did she fail to do? And I didn't have sufficient knowledge and training and experience to express those views to her. I wish I had. But I think it's a trap that human beings easily fall into. Yes, and if we only read the Psalms with open eyes, it could be really helpful in different situations of life when you are up and when you are down. And to see not only a verse here, a line here and there, but to see how, as I said, Psalm 105 and 106 follow each other. 22 and 23. And we gave examples of this a few times in these lessons in this quarter. Larry? You were talking about the rescue and salvation, and we frequently think of that as a, a now event. And I'm drowning, you come rescue me. So it's a now event. Is there some sense in which the idea of rescue salvation is still going to work in heaven? And that, you know, we talk about the fact that sin isn't going to arise. And we've talked about the fact that it's not because God's outlawed it, but for other reasons. So I'm curious, as we're developing the idea of people constantly needing the salvation here, is our mindset going to change, or will we need to constantly keep the mindset of understanding our need for salvation when we're in heaven? I think many times, at least I grew up with the idea that when that event happens, it's over and done with. And as I begin to think about this week's lessons, it seems like it's something that takes on a whole bigger meaning, especially with the things you've been stressing about remembrance. And that's why the memory cannot be wiped out. And when the Bible speaks about things that will not be remembered, it's just shorthand for we will be able to process it properly. Just as now you can remember a bad event from your childhood when you were a pathfinder and rain spoiled your holiday or your camp and you can laugh about it and you don't cry as you did then because you learn to process it. You, you have a different perspective to it. And so part of that is the problem that we associate grace with forgiveness of sins. And we don't realize that grace is the fuel on which Christians run. And the closer you come to God, the more grace you need. And that's why we will learn to appreciate grace even more during the eternity and remember what has happened and learn the lesson. And of course, if there is no outside environment that tempts you to do the wrong things, your commitment to God keeps you in straight and narrow. But you still need God's grace and perspective. Back to Larry. What you just said struck me because of a dilemma that's going on in my life. It seems like as I get older, I do get closer to God, but I also find that the things that can separate me from God happen quicker and with greater clarity, if that makes sense. And so I struggle with the fact because things I was close to God two weeks ago, why do I feel so far away from him today? And 15 years ago, I never even gave a thought to that kind of thinking. So I appreciate that statement you made. Thank you. Yeah, because it's the nature of reality that this side of Garden of Eden goes up and goes down. And the closer you come to God, the more things you see that you didn't see 10 years ago and they didn't even bother you. But the closer you come, the more sensitive you become and you see things that you didn't see before. And that's why the role of grace is so important. Lou. Take David, for example. I personally like to think of the statement, 
that David is a man after God's own heart. To me, that means that David would seek wholeheartedly after God and his heart. And it wasn't mean that David was perfect. It means that David sought after God with his whole heart when he sought after him. And I think that's a beautiful way to think about it. And that's what he wants from us to seek him with our whole heart and just day by day and let him change us from our worst potential to his greatest plans for our lives. And so to me, that's when it says David is a man after God's own heart. He really, really, really sought God when he was sorry. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Psalm 80, Wednesday's lesson, Israel portrayed as a vineyard. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine, that we may be saved. Well, he oh. says, stir up your mind. You have become rather weak lately. But then he adds, restore us of God. Let your face shine. In other words, we see a sad face. We see an angry face. So we want to see a smiling face upon us so that we might be saved. And verse 4. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors. Our enemies laugh among themselves. And now comes the refrain again, verse 7. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And now he goes into the history, verse 8. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. And what is the solution? Have you noticed in verses 5 and 6, who is the cause of the defeat? You made us thorn of our neighbors, our enemies. You fed them bread of tears, giving them tears to drink. Do you see the poetry, the poetic language? And so what is the solution? Verse 14. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. Who is doing the mediation? Who is interceding here? And what is the solution? The solution is for God to turn. Yeah, let's read. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. So, what is the significance of this psalm that Israel is portrayed as a vineyard, that God uprooted from Egypt, transported to the promised land, where there should be abundance, but... It's destroyed, and what needs to happen? Turn again, God, restore us. And for the third time in verse 19, restore us, O Lord, God of hosts, let your face shine that we may be saved. Tim? Perhaps it's just an intentional oversight on the part of the author, but it seems to miss the larger context of the history of the Old Testament, as well as all the writings of the prophets. If, in fact, God can be said to have turned, Every one of the prophets says it's because you turned from God. Tim, let's get this into historical perspective. So it says here at the beginning, Psalm of Azaf. So who is Azaf? Well, I thought he wrote later than perhaps he did. That's why I made my comment. <laughs> so he would be a contemporary of David. So we are in about 1000 before Christ. And of course, Isaiah's ministry starts 740. So... 
Isaiah would be 250 years after Azaf. Now, we are not going to discuss whether Ezra somehow edited this and there is some editor's pen and hand there. Maybe yes, maybe no. There's no end of those discussions. But if we take it at face value that Azaf wrote this, so we are about 1000 before Christ. Now, how is Isaiah going to pick up in chapter 5 this idea of the vineyard or God 250 years later? Any recollections what Isaiah is going to say? He tells us that God planted them as a vineyard and put a wall and a hedge around them and took care of their needs. So Isaiah provides a perspective that balances that picture. Now, of course, even Azaf here says at the end, restore us, O Lord, let your face shine that we may be saved. But notice it's connecting the ironic blessing from number six. If you show a smiling face to us, then we will turn again, God, you know, you did this, you did that. And it's time, let me remind you, give ear, shepherd of Israel, stir up your might because you have been rather weak lately. Come and save us. It's time you do something. Isaiah says, actually, I did more than you can ever acknowledge. And if you are where you are, it's not because I need to turn. It's because you turned. And then you can go to Matthew. 21, verses 33, Jesus tells the parable of the landowner who plants a vineyard and how Jesus brings another perspective, another 700 years after Isaiah. I did everything to that vineyard, yet it did not produce the expected outcome. Is there anything more I could have done, I should have done? Now, can you see how the prayer can be inspired even if you don't get all the facts straight and right? like in Psalm 80. As we said in the previous lesson, Psalms show us that all emotions that you experience are legitimate. You have Psalms of disorientation, Psalms of reorientation. You don't have only positive Psalms. The Lord is my fortress, my high rock, my refuge. You have these Psalms where the psalmist says, Lord, it's a time that you wake up. Listen to me. Do something. Show your might. And no lightning comes from the skies and kills him. Who are you to talk to me like this? I am your God. Now, most of you remember what would happen when, if you talk to your mother like this a few decades ago, she would not be very pleased or amused. Yet, psalmists speak to God. Azaf says, stir up your mind. Come and save us. How long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with bread of tears, given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us scorn of our neighbors. Our enemies laugh among themselves. Whose fault is that? Let me remind you, you brought the wine out of Egypt. And now boars are ravaging it. Turn again, Lord. Do what you are supposed to do. That's why we serve you as a God. Deliver. And the lightning came from the Lord and everything went up in smoke. Right? No. God said, let's write it down and put it part of the inspired collection so that generation after generation can learn that this is a legitimate expression of how people feel. Just like the book of Job, you have the speeches of Job that you don't quote in a normal church, in a normal worship service, because it borders on blasphemy. Yet at the end, God says, he raises the hand of Job and says, I understand, we in heaven can understand. Can you see the value of the inspired collection of prayers like this? Michael, it certainly sounds like the psalmist is bargaining with God. If you'll fix this, I'll do that, which is really preposterous when you think about it. But I can understand how he would get that way. You know, I tried everything else, but I'll really, I promise, I'll do these things and these things, but I want you to fix this thing. But didn't Jacob say that when God finally reveals to him after stealing the birthright, lying, and instead of giving him a presentation, a lecture or sermon on ethics and ethical behavior, he says, I will be with you. I will bring you back. And Jacob says, if you do that, then I might give you 10%. I will come back here. And he's in no hurry to come back to Bethel when he comes back. And we can still discuss how he understood that 10%, whether the bribes that he sent to Esau, he considered that he gave it to God. And that is the tithe that he paid. Well, that's for another day. Larry? I understand things differently now than I did 20, 30, and 40 years ago. And I do find it 
disconcerting that God doesn't allow us to compartmentalize our life. The accountant in me wants to have everything in its neat little office, everything done nicely. As I've gotten older, I realize that there really is a circle of life, that everything is connected, and that all of the emotions of love, anger, fear, rejoicing, the singing, and all of the things we've been discussing are all connected, and they're connected in such a way that as we get to understand that, we begin to see the beauty of why God created man and women and the concept of the two coming together to become one and how that change in your thinking takes place, which helps with the idea of salvation. I appreciate studying the Psalms because when you read them at the face, it's easy to not see the big picture but to see the little moment. And we get caught up in that. And I appreciate what you're doing here. Thank you. And it's easy, especially if you live in a world that is governed by emotions. If I feel this way, that's the reality. If I feel strongly about something, that's how it is. And you miss the bigger picture. You miss the connections. It's not like that. Once again, since our last recording, I was beyond the polar circle in up north Norway. And suddenly you look at the sky and you say, oh, it's about this time. And then you realize, no, no, no. It's one o'clock after midnight, yet the light is like three o'clock in the afternoon. And you realize, yeah, I judge things from my own experience. I need to correct <laughs> my understanding. Now, I would be willing to argue and to fight that, no, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, just given the light conditions. Then you realize, actually, yeah. In London, that would be three o'clock. In Tromso, <laughs> it's the polar night. And at three o'clock in the morning, it's still the same level of light at this time of year. All right, Karen. I was responding to the question about how can we show faithfulness and fruitfulness in our lives. And reflecting that we show faithfulness to God when we remember his continued love for us. And then we show fruitfulness when we take that love and put it into action and share it with others. So it's passing God's love on through our lives. And can you see for all of us at the end of Psalm 80, how the psalmist exhibits a confident trust in God who will create the future, who will be the good shepherd, and how he expresses the fact that Israel has no other alternative than just entrusts herself to the God who has broken down the walls and the God who judged them is the God who will save them and so in whatever season of life when you are up or down you can trust this God because he will ultimately deliver and that's why these historic psalms are valuable because in a poetic way they deliver the message that you and I need to hear in different seasons of life in different situations of life when we are up and down all right, the last part, the lesson for Thursday, Psalm 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord. You that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for he is gracious. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. Let's go to 13 and 14. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Look, you have seen in Psalm 105 how he positively portrays the history of Israel, getting them out of Egypt, getting them into the promised land, giving them the kingdom. You have seen in Psalm 106, the very next one, how he concentrates on the dark side. We have sinned, we have rebelled, we have not followed you. We made the golden calf. We forgot God, our savior. We mingled with nations. We served idols. We sacrificed our sons. We poured out innocent blood. And yet, like in 135, there is this note, not only the triumph at past victories, but the trust for the future ones. Your name, God, endures forever. You are throughout the ages. Where is the hope of Israel? That they need rescuing from this God. For God will vindicate his people, have compassion on his servants. And by the way, verse 15 and 16. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, 
the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. And there is no breath in their mouths. Those who make them and all who trust them shall become like them. But you, verse 19, house of Israel. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, he who resides in Jerusalem. Why is he supposed to be blessed, the Lord from Zion? Because he resides in Jerusalem. And then the next Psalm 136 will be, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And this is the antiphonal. He is the one who is above all. He killed the famous kings. He did this and this. And the next one, after 135, about the Lord who resides in Jerusalem, how he defeated all the kings. And that's why give thanks to the Lord of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Comes 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and we cried when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps, when our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors asked us to sing, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion, sing us from your hymnal. How could we sing the Lord's song in the foreign land? How can we say our God is good, our God is great, his mercy and steadfast love endures forever. So let me tell you what I feel. O oh, daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall be he who pays you back for what you have done to us. Happy shall be who will take your little ones and dash them against the rock. So what's the value of some historical psalms like this? 135 all the way to 137. In what sense they are inspired? If you did the collection of psalms, would you include? 137. You know how many Christians with plain reading struggle with that? Is a good Christian supposed to feel like this? But can you see 135, 136, 137? So, what's the value of historic Psalms? Which ones do you pray with the psalmist? Which ones do you skip? Where was your Bible glued when you grew up? And which ones caused the crisis of faith? And remember, why do we have historical psalms? Because of Zakar, remember. Do you feel like, in the words of famous theologian John McEnroe, you can't be serious? Lord, you can't be serious that this is happening to me, that this is going on in my life. Where are the promises? Now, of course, as a good Christian, you would not pray 137 verses 9 on your enemies. But how that history becomes our history? Because if you don't have Psalm 137, you are going to romanticize the history. History becomes legends from the lives of saints. You know what's the most important development in the last 40 years in Adventist history? That we moved from legends from the lives of saints to writing history. The Movement of Destiny by Roy Edwin Froome. I still remember in early 70s when it came out. And George Knight how we stopped writing the legends from the lives of saints and we started writing history because that history is part of our history. And if you don't do it, you are going to romanticize the history. Do we struggle with grasping and not trusting God? Do we struggle with harsh feelings, with events that we don't understand, that we wish were otherwise? Let's go to Karen. When I teach pastoral care, I tell people just... Don't hold on to the things people say when they're in trauma and grief. They will say all kinds of things. Just let it go and accept them and listen for the needs underneath whatever they're saying. Their need for comfort, their need for compassion, because their words are just words they're using just to express, this is more than I can tolerate right now, and I don't have the words for it, and I'm just using these words because that's all I have. And as we say in parenting, if you have slept well, if you are in the right place of your hormonal cycle, if the eruptions on the sun are not too disturbing and your daughter drops on the floor in the supermarket and says, I hate you, I hate you, a terrible mother because you don't buy me a Mars bar, you can deal with it because you see the bigger picture. Now, 
at three years of age, she doesn't have the vocabulary. She doesn't have the capacity to deal with strong emotions, but that's what she feels. Now, if you are insecure mother, wow, that is going to have some far-reaching consequences because oh, what are these people going to think about me? I am such a terrible, lousy mother. Oh, here is the Mars bar. Does have it. Well, wait, 15 years later, when she will be 18, she learned the lesson how to get what she wants. But if you are a secure mother, no problem. You can deal with that tantrum. Don't you think that the book of Psalms is an important collection of the canon because it teaches us that we deal with a secure God who cannot be blackmailed? Do you think that Moloch or Zeus or Baal could tolerate the language that you find in the book of Psalms? Do you think that King Jong-ul or some other dictators that we are not going to name would tolerate the language like this? And that's why they are inspired. Because it tells you that with God, you can say what you feel. And the most important thing is we are on a journey. And as long as we learn, as long as we are getting and seeing the bigger picture, one day we'll be there. Rita? These historic or history psalms Remind me a bit about the multiple series now that have been on the television of Who Do You Think You Are? Yes. Celebrities looking back at their family trees and finding out things that they never knew and the effect that that has had on them. They find out things about some of their ancestors who they never knew about and how wonderful they were about then how they crashed and it's just such a roller coaster that it really does affect you when you know about your history where you've come from what has happened before that whole history becomes part of you you own it and I think that's the important thing here that they're owning it so they are part of it and we become part of it too by owning it and that's how Zakar functions in biblical worship that when you remember the story, you become part of the larger or the bigger story. The only way to redeem a broken story is to embed it in the bigger story. And people who live in a glass house should not throw stones. Michael? I was told some years ago that if I would read all the Psalms carefully, I will see just about every single human emotion, high, low, problem, difficulty that exists in humankind. And uh, if you read them carefully, I was told, you'll learn some lessons to live life on life's terms. All right. If you don't read historic psalms, you will end up in romanticizing your history. You will end up in triumphalism. You end up intolerant of other people. You don't understand how they can struggle with emotions like these, with events and experiences like that. But if you are praying with the psalmist, you will see the identity is not based on what you and I experience, what you and I go through, but in the faithfulness of God who can work with these broken people and use people who still need rescuing as part of the rescue for others. And back to what Karen said, we show faithfulness to God when we remember his continued love for us and fruitfulness when we put his love into action so that others are blessed. Because through you, all the families, all the tribes of the earth will be blessed. And the historic psalms beautifully illustrate this. Yes, God has used them. God has brought them out of Egypt. God has brought them into Canaan. He gave them the monarchy and the kingdom. They messed it up. But still, God did not abandon the project. They are still part of what God is doing. And it's true like that. The medieval church was not able to mess it up. The Protestant Orthodoxy, Reformation, Orthodoxy was not able to mess it up. The legalistic Adventism of pre Minneapolis was not able to mess it up. And hopefully even the polarized Adventism of the current era cannot mess it up because it's not about us, it's about God. And that's why historic Psalms are important. Let's pray. Our God, when we go through a roller coaster of emotions and once we are up, next time we are down, it's easy to feel that somehow you have abandoned us, that you are not there, that you are not delivering on your promises. All the while, we have only a wrong understanding what you are supposed to do and 
why you are a God and why we serve you. So we pray that as we and the whole church studies these Psalms, they help us to see how you dealt with people in the past and how you were able to manage even the worst crisis in the history of your people so that something good comes out of them. And we cling to that hope and we want to express our love for you and that you are our only hope and that we want to serve you in good times, in bad times, and for all eternity. And we thank you that we serve a God who is big enough and secure enough to take the roller coaster of our emotions and to create it into something marvelous and wonderful. And for that, let there be eternal glory to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>